And if you don't want, just let us know so that the recording will be interrupted. The low X physics, saturation, and also diffraction, both at the uh, EIC and uh, the LHC, I mean, to bring both uh, community uh, together, basically. So before we detail a bit the program, so I will let uh, the, uh, basically first an introduction by the director of the ET star, I mean, to introduce to the to ECT star, and I, on behalf of all of us, I think I thank very much, I mean, for ECT Star for accepting us and also for organizing uh, this very nice uh, workshop. So thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, Christoph, but we have to thank you for organizing it. We are uh, not the organizers. So uh, thanks everyone. Um, so I'll give just a three minute introduction and, and say welcome to you. Um, so many of you know about ECT Star uh, already. So this is uh, mostly aimed at the people who may be here for the first time, say. Um, so ECT Star was founded uh, in 1993, so it's been around for quite some time. It's a bottom-up community-driven uh, center, and the aim is to obviously do research in, in uh, theoretical nuclear physics, and promote activities between theory and experiment, and also related areas, and also train uh, young researchers. And actually, currently, the doctoral training program has, is going on. It started, uh, it started yesterday. Um, so here's an overview of all the activities for 2021. It's very small, but you can see it on the website as well. Uh, the doctoral training program, as I said, has, has just started yesterday, and the talent school will start at the end of, uh, of, of next month, and in July it will start. Um, most activities, all activities are online, obviously, as you can imagine, but the good news is that at the end of September, uh, we are considering to go back to um, well, not go back, but to have hybrid meetings with a limited number of people uh, present at ECT Star and all the other people joining uh, online. So we're very much looking forward to that uh, possibility. And then there's also a visitor program uh, that's currently dormant because there's essentially uh, no one really in the in the villa. But when it restarts, you of course very welcome to visit uh, ECT Star. Um, okay, we have a Twitter account. We only joined very recently, so we're all still very fresh about Twitter. Um, so please follow uh, follow the, the account. Um, a few words about related areas. It's, it's very broad, and, and that's the, the point, actually. So it covers astrophysics, cosmology, quantum field theory, cold atomic gases, say, but also quantum technology, quantum computing, machine learning. Um, and those last two activities obviously uh, have a lot of attention uh, at the moment, so it's it's in a way it's important for the nuclear physics community to uh, to engage with those new areas. And there's obviously interesting physics to be done, say related to the quantum quantum any body problem, but also interesting problems in general in, in quantum technology. Um, <clears throat> the scientific board uh, essentially determines the program of workshop and, and training programs. Um, so this is the the membership, <coughs> sorry, as it was last month, we have, or, you know, we change uh, every now and then. I have to update this slide. A um, point to make here is that the membership of the scientific board is uh, suggested by ECT Star Associates. And everyone who attends a, a workshop automatically also becomes an associate. So um, this means you get updates about workshops or about postdoc positions, and you can also uh, uh, suggest scientific board uh, members. A few words about funding then. So locally, ECT Star is part of and funded by the Bruno Kessler Foundation, which is based in Trento. Uh, FBK runs uh, a number of research centers and um, we are the one, say the most fundamental science uh, one. And then there is funding from the national funding agencies throughout Europe. And there's also funding from the EU, say via the Horizon 2020 programs. And it's kind of interesting that uh, ECT Star is the only theoretical a facility recognized as a transnational access facility by, by NUPEC. So it is on an equal footing as the experimental labs, um, except it's obviously a mostly theoretical uh, facility. So here's an overview of the, of the funders. So the, the big ones in uh, the European countries like uh, UKRI in the UK and CA and CNRS in France, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and, you know, many countries contribute, but uh, not all. Um, um, and that was it really what I wanted to say. So for those of you who've never been to Trento, this is what the villa looks like in which you, the meeting or the coffee breaks would take place if it would be in person. And um, yeah, so uh, enjoy the, the meeting.
So thank you, thank you very much. So are there some uh, questions about the Institute? I mean, or the, the program or anything you would like to ask? <laughs> so let me discuss very briefly, I mean, the organization of the, the meeting. So as you know, we have basically three days for the, the meeting. So today we will have some uh, discussion also about the LHC and the uh, EIC, I mean, related also to saturation and art diffraction and this kind of, of topic that we'll have today. Tomorrow will be also some uh, discussion, which is something related to a recent, I mean, uh, discovery of the, the Oderon. So that's why there will be many talks which are dedicated to the Oderon that are fully some discussion about it. If there is a general agreement, the, what are the news concerning and other possibilities maybe to see the, the Oderon. And then on the Thursday, which will be the, the last day of the, the meeting, it will be dedicated to BFKL uh, studies and also muller Lambleget, jet cap jet different way to see both uh, BFKL evolution and also the uh, saturation. So, and this will conclude, I mean, our three day uh, workshop. So the, uh, the organization will be always in the afternoon in uh, Europe, basically, and morning in the US, so that both communities can attend the, the, the program. So it will be always three half days for the workshop. And also, I should mention already that this is a kind of a preview of a longer workshop that will happen uh, next year. So the, uh, throughout the, the beginning of July, there are some preliminary dates, which will be normally, hopefully, in person in Treto again, this time for a full week. So this will be a kind of a, some talks, which will be the topic that we will discuss in uh, more detail and in meeting in person, which is always better, of course, for discussion and so on. But again, I mean, we can start uh, all of this uh, this year and hopefully we'll get a successful workshop, not only with the talks, but also we put also some time for discussions, I mean, to discuss the different topics. So this is what I wanted to say concerning the, the announcement. I mean, also, I would like to, to mention, as you know, the, uh, the people. I mean, it's not only me who was organizing the, the workshop, but we were a, a team. So there is Agustin, Seren, Abe, Gregory, and uh, Martin. So I would like to, to thank, I mean, on behalf of all of us, to thank all of us, all of them for uh, organizing, I mean, this uh, workshop and helping to get uh, all this nice uh, program, uh, which is foreseen for these three days. So I don't know if there are some uh, questions or comments about the program or about the schedule. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I'm waiting just a couple of minutes if people have questions or comments. So we will get the first, uh, the first talk. Let me go to the agenda. Will be the, uh, so an introduction about the uh, network which is called the Strong 2020, which is part of the organization of this uh, workshop. And the two uh, people who are responsible for the, this network are connected uh, today. So that's why we'll hear about this new uh, network. And again, the, the way that they help us also for uh, developing the, these topics, directly the topic of this workshop and also of the, of the network. So please go ahead. You should be able to share, I guess. Yeah, okay, let me try. Uh, let me try. You can see my slides. Yeah. I'm not going to make them full screen because the aspect ratio is aspect ratio is bad. Uh, but I, if this is okay, uh, okay. So I don't want to uh, take a lot of time away from actual physics, uh, and uh, but I'll just uh, say a few words about this uh, about this uh, strong 2020 network, which of course many. Many, if not most, of the people uh, in this workshop already are are members in or have uh, have are already aware of. Um, so this is a. So so what is this? And because this is a little bit could kind of these big uh, things, uh, <laughs> complicated bureaucratic things may, could be can be a little confusing sometimes. So do, let me just say a few few words about what this is. So first of all, what is the Strong Twenty Twenty project? So this is a. Um, a project in the EU Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program under the topic of integrating and opening research infrastructures of European interest. So this is, and this is a four year thing. Uh, so started actually already in June 2019 and will uh, continue until uh, May 2023. Uh, three. Although there's uh, 
there are there are discussions about asking for an extension of one year to this project. So it might be that this will get the, the end the end date will be extended by one year, which of course is, is not going to bring any new money, but uh, that would be helpful in the organizing. So this total strong 2020 is a 10 million euro uh, project. So this is kind of a big, but it's also a big amount of somehow funding that is distributed divided into lot of small lots of small pieces. So there's 44 institutions, uh, and the whole thing is divided into 32 work packages. So this is kind of a, uh, in some sense, an administrative nightmare. This uh, this whole thing. There are transnational access work packages. There are virtual access work packages. There are networking activities, and then there are, there are joint research activities. And uh, and what most of this, what this most of this funding does is that it. Is the, somehow the basic idea is that it funds access to uh, transnational access to laboratories. So somehow that the, there are like uh, somehow me medium-sized hadron physics laboratories and also CERN. So this uh, this money can be used for uh, is mostly mostly there to enable access from other countries to these uh, laboratories. Also, this funds ECT star. So kind of ECT star here is in this in the whole strong 2020 thing is one of these core key infrastructures uh, and and the ECD star get receives funding from this uh, thing in order to enable enable access from uh, for people from uh, other european countries now within this big strong 2020 thing uh, one of these uh, many work packages is our uh, a small x physics network which has the title physics uh, small x Physics at the LHC and future DIS experiments. So what the um, so this is our somehow the, the 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 work package or the network in this big strong 2020 thing that me and Nestor are me and Nestor are coordinating. Uh, what are the physics that physics topics that we mentioned in this uh, are in principle uh, trying to somehow focus on in this uh, in this network? There is uh, nuclear PDFs. Uh, so uh, LHC and nuclear, other new data in new PDF fits, connections to future deep, deep plastic scattering experiments, EIC, LHEC. Uh, then new theory in, uh, in somehow small X theory, NLO-based NLO -based phenomenology, both in CGC and in BFKL uh, pictures. Uh, NLOBK fits uh, under studying the Jimwalk equation, properties of BFKL equation at NLO and applications to phenomenology. Then there's a work package, on, uh, somehow a task on TMDs, transverse momentum distributions at leading order next to leading order, and then multiparticle correlations and thermalization, which is kind of related to initial stages of heavy ion collision. So as you can see, kind of this, uh, there's a very large overlap with these themes, uh, with this workshop. And uh, with this workshop, so this is why kind of we, we kind of felt that um, we would uh, we would be happy to somehow consider this workshop that uh, Christoph has the main responsibility for organizing as as kind of a part of our network activity, seeing that both the topics and a large part of the people uh, present are are working are somehow there's a there's a very such a strong overlap. So the members uh, in this in this network that we were somehow initially were on our list, I think there's a few few new that have uh, come in later words, is a uh, 14-ish institutes from different parts of Europe, and of course some of these uh, some of these are are just somehow okay. So so some of these net these institutes are kind of receiving some funding, and others are just kind of participating in the network, and uh, and, and members in the network. What our network funding has been used is that we have been we have two joint postdocs. We have had the idea has been that we actually try to foster collaboration within the network by having hiring a postdoc who is then supposed to who is then moving from one institute in the network to another. So this includes there's Florian Kugulik who is who will be moving from Uvascula to Santiago at some point, and then Victor Villa who is uh, at CNRS in in Paris, uh, in different, uh, and then. Uh, will be in uh, in Krakow. And then uh, somehow, of course, a significant part of this is that there was a total of 64,000 euros of travel money. And of course, since the network had barely started uh, operating when uh, when this COVID epidemic hit, uh, most of this money is still unused. So some of it is some of it is distributed 
among uh, some of these institutes specifically, I mean, to be used by the network members in, in this institute. Uh, but then there's a big chunk which is left over at Uvascula and Santiago de Compostela uh, with the idea that, uh, that those, those people in this, in this network and somehow, and this is kind of relatively loosely defined, were participating in this network, I mean, can take advantage of this money uh, to have uh, fun travel for collaboration or workshop participation. So, for example, uh, this is something that we can keep in mind for next summer's ECD workshop, which hopefully will take place physically in Trento. And, and if people need need help from uh, need help to to travel there, uh, we can uh, we can try to we can try to uh, arrange something with Nestor from using this funding. And that, that, that is what this, that's what it's there for. Somehow our, our original proposal called for an annual, annual workshop on small X uh, to be organized most likely in ECT star Trento. And this is a kind of, we are, we, are, we took the liberty of, of somehow considering this workshop as as our as the annual workshop of of the strong 20 of the small x network in the strong 2020 and this is why we wanted to somehow bring this up bring this up here and and keep it in the back of the mind for for next summer but this is everything that i have i didn't want to take uh, take more time for and from going to physics so questions uh, so thank you, uh, Thomas, and thank you, Nestor, also, I mean, bo both of you, of course. So the, uh, so are there questions, comments, I mean, for the, about the network and the way it works? And then, I of guess. course, what, what, I, what I should mention is that now, under COVID times, we, we would, normally we would somehow prefer, I mean, we would, our main purpose has been somehow trying to enable travel, but now we have had a monthly, semi monthly small like seminars. Uh, in this network so zoom seminars and if somehow you are not on the on the mailing list and are interested in uh, in joining uh, let me and Nestor know and uh, and we'll add you to the mailing list for this uh, for our monthly seminars yeah. this month yeah. not because the, because of this workshop we decided we don't want to there's we, we're not having an overlapping seminar now but yeah. uh, starting I have, I have a question maybe i mean for both for the seminars and so on i guess it's opened also to non-europeans yeah you can absolutely. still be a kind of observer from us or mexico I'm, brazil I'm, and, yeah. I'm, absolutely somehow the, the only thing that is there written in the grant uh, in the in the grant agreement is is the subset of these institutes that are actually getting funding for for postdocs Otherwise, we are fully inclusive. So any uh, somehow every every sem seminar, every workshop, uh, it's completely open. It's I, so this is kind of uh, this list actually. This particular list doesn't actually appear in any official document. In the <laughs> so, any, so somehow we are very open to everybody. And actually, the list is uh, presently is bigger. Than yes. The yeah. people from in this room, they have joined, etc. Thank you. So, so just let, let me and Nestor know, and if you are interested in, in seminars, and uh, we'll add you to the email list. And this. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much again. I don't see any hands raised or any, anybody asking questions. So thank you again, uh, Nestor and uh, Thomas. So, let's, so the next uh, speaker will be uh, Irais. So discuss the recent uh, results from the LHC on diffraction and the Hadron physics, so the LHC side, before going to the EIC for the, the next talk. So Irais, you should be able to share the slide. Yeah. Hello, can you see now the slides? Yeah, you can see. Maybe the voice is a bit low. I don't know if it's only me or if you could speak oh, okay. slightly louder. <laughs> it would be perfect, uh, sorry. Yeah, just one second. Now, okay, then? Yeah, better better. yeah, thank you. Thank you, I will mute. Okay, thank you. So I uh, will present some uh, briefly. Uh, maybe, uh, Irais, could, could you put full screen maybe? Because we see uh, it's not full screen. I don't know if you can, if you cannot, okay, I mean, yeah. it's fine. It's not a big deal. Uh, yeah, Is it perfect. better now? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, per perfect. Yeah, okay. So uh, please uh, stop me when whatever you like. And I, I, I Thank very much the organizers for this invitation and for this night workshop organization. And also, uh, I would like now to say that I will present 
a summary of the results from LAC on diffraction and atom physics. Um, but this is a personal view from these recent results. Okay, so uh, first I would like just to introduce the detectors. Uh, so uh, we will see that the, here is the Alice detector, and these are the main components from the Alice detector. So they um, mainly we can see the that the forward physics analysis is in within this acceptance for the detectors that we use from the videos. Also from the LACV detector, we have a different acceptance that is, uh, in, is uh, going higher in, in the rapidity. And this is the veto that this is taking. And also we can see here the, the detector components. Uh, for the CMS detectors, there is uh, there is also the forward uh, detector at CMS that they are using it, and then we see here the, the, also the acceptance in the forward uh, regions. We have also castor uh, that is a, a, a calorimeter that is using at CMS, and it's mostly. Uh, deploy at the LAC for 40 meters from the interaction point. So we have this acceptance ratio between uh, higher, which is minus 6.6 to 5.2 in the rapidity range. And also uh, here is the totem. Uh, uh, we can see that the, here uh, it consists in, in two near beam telescopes with the Roman pot, and then it, it, leads, it leads by the photon measurements that is due to 147 meters and to, 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 to 20 meters from the interaction point. So, re results from the also uh, considering the Atlas detector, and this is a two, two 10 meters that is a using by the AF AFP, which is a forward proton spectrometer, which is the highest uh, acceptance in, in rapidity range. So. Okay, so one of the main results that they, they have published is a coherent jet side cross-section from the ALICE and the LACB detectors. And uh, here we can see the 2021, um, results and then the, the comparisons within the uh, Starlight EPS09 and uh, EPSAT and BGK. And then the, we can see that it, it is uh, consistent uh, mainly with EPS09 uh, linear order uh, model as uh, also with EPSAT. So there's a little bit of tension with the, this model at semi-forward rapidity, but uh, data for with LACB agrees with this model still. So this is uh, uh, one of the results. And then uh, for also for uh, here, uh, the, the, this will be a contribution from the nuclear suppression factor. Uh, there will be a mid-rapidity. And then, then we have here a, a approximation for the nuclear effects that is a, a contributing to this a, to this observable. So the, the nuclear uh, suppression factor here will help us to provide a way to test this consistency of big data and the available nuclear and PDF uh, measurement to the glue and shadow factor. So these are the measurement for Alice uh, at five point two and again we see a uh, consistency with the uh, that and then it's a uh, your, your eyes, sorry, but the sound is getting very faint, at least for me. I don't know if it's for everybody. Is it now better? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, better. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that I, I just moved forward. But okay, so um, we can now pass to the coherent jet size t dependence, and here uh, we show uh, that the dependence on on the pg square in the photon production is a, a photonuclear production, and here uh, we prove the transverse gluonic structure from the nucleus at low x. 
So again, there's a comparison with the starlight, LAD uh, nuclear shadowing, and also, also the BQ gluon saturation models. Now, uh, there's a, also a result from the for preliminary from LAC, and this is taken from the recent conference of LAC B uh, 2021. And here is uh, the result for the forward and uh, central uh, rapidity range for ALICE. And on top of that is uh, the results preliminary from LAC B. Uh, both are, or them are consistent, and then we see that it, it comes up on the 15, um, and those results are coming from also from round one and round two data. Again, we have here the comparison from EPPS 16, and then this is also the reunion version. For the peripheral photo production, uh, there is a, a measurement that is recently published in, in this uh, aerophysics volume. Um, and then it's also the starlight collaboration results. And then here we observe with the data from ROM1 uh, by Alice, and it's confirmed by also by the data measurements from LACB and STARS. So um, we see that UPC that it has also a potential for tetraquar discoveries. Uh, and this is also observed in, in a state uh, of a tetraquar state that in an inclusive example. For this is a, one of the measurements published by LACB recently. And there's also been searches in ALICE and uh, new searches in LACB that are, are ongoing. For the case of the coherent role in let let so generally there is a good agreement with the models on the, on the market. And then there's also a, a, a waiting for the, the reduced uncertainties that is uh, improving and is getting better with the agreement of the models. And also the different neutron emission classes are equal to the different impact parameters. So uh, we see that the factorization holds uh, for this data at uh, let, let 5.02 TV. And uh, there are, in the case of the three coherent systems, for example, in proton, lead, and xenon, there's a fit of, uh, which is obtaining a, a dependence in, in the slope. And uh, we see that the, still the black this regime is, is far away. And the models based on, on, on green global shadowing or hot spot uh, can describe well data reasonably. So now for the results from ATLAS, for ATLAS collaborations, uh, there's a, the measurements of inclusive single diffraction dissociation cross-section for proton-proton collisions at ATB. And there's a, here is this, the measurement from the alpha roman pot stations that also are um, on the ongoing LAC beams. And here is a, it, it is taken by a special ROM uh, with a luminosity of 1.76 uh, nanobars. Uh, so uh, this is a, the data taken uh, from Atlas at 8 point, at 8 TV. There's also a measurement from the inclusive diffractive dissociate close section. Uh, well, for this, uh, there's a uh, the single diffractive dissociation at the addon level is taking the, the cross-section versus uh, uh, these three variables of the rapidity T and, and, and C. And also the background is taken from the no single diffractive proton-proton collisions. And uh, 
Well, here is a, the strategy is to correlate the signals in the alpha and the inner detector to estimate it from the uh, Monte Carlo. And then the overlay background is, a, is taken in consonance from the, uh, the signal with the alpha uh, detector and with the uncorrelated signal with the inner detector. So this data-driven estimate contributes to the large uncertainty. And uh, this is the, the measurement with the obtained uh, in this uh, regime of uh, rapidity. So we see that the data here is compared with the PTA8 uh, with the, well, these two versions and also with hair with seven. So the generators describe uh, the shape uh, quite reasonable, but uh, there's a, a overestimate of the cross section. For the measurement of the, uh, well, here still uh, for this measurement, the differential cross section, we can do it uh, as a function of t. So here, uh, there's a generation of predictions from the slope from the 782 and uh, for the first version of PTA and for the second version of PTA and 7.10. So the measurement is uh, 7.65 with this uh, statistical and systematic errors. And we see that the systematic is dominated by the proton overlay on the background. For the DPS studies in the four jets with the low PT at uh, 13 TV, there is, uh, uh, here is a, the measurement and we see that uh, linear order models still uh, overshoot the data. Uh, but uh, there is a forward uh, background uh, low PT jets that uh, with the cross section prediction improves uh, the next to leader order or high multiplicity uh, ME for, uh, well, for not, not for all the models, but uh, it still improves. So there's a favor for angular ordering uh, and the dipole antenna uh, PS model over the PT order of showers. So this is uh, done for 13 TV and uh, this is a new result from CMS. And uh, here is uh, the comparison from the uh, measurement of uh, effective cross-section measurements uh, within the different detectors, ATLAS, CMS, CDF, and UA2. And we see that there is a strong dependence of the structure value of this uh, of the of the cross section of the effective cross section on the model, and this to describe the SPS contribution, and then that the next to leading order models uh, with two to two and two to three uh, are smaller than uh, ten MeV. So this uh, implies that. Uh, is a needed a uh, graded uh, DPS contribution in this. So by including the four partons on, on these models, uh, one can see that the DPS like correlation uh, is, is within the effective cross section of 15 milliwatts, so that the largest value uh, of around or greater than 20 is it found only with the linear order models from two to two. And so here is a comparison with the different MC8 uh, NLO calculations. And the, 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 here is a, a, the description of, of the cross section within the uncertainties. And uh, we see that there is a well-modeled collisions of energy dependence for these MPAI parameters, uh, which are tuned. And uh, 
also for the area and normalized distribution. Uh, for the case of the uh, hard color singlet exchange in these digit events, at the, also at Turton TV, uh, these are uh, recently results from CMS and it's accepted already for PRD publication. And here it presents the event selection for particle flow and anti-KT jets for R.4, uh, and also the result from the two leading jets for PT greater than 14 GB, and the result from the leading jet for, uh, within the rapidity of 1.4 and 4.7. So we see that the, it uh, within this, uh, it favors the, the teach channel exchange, and uh, there's a pseudo rapidity gap with a charged particle multiplicity, uh, which is leading by the two jets uh, from PT larger than 200 MeV within the eta interval of uh, less than, uh, well, minus one and one. So the fraction of these digit events produced by color single exchange can be uh, expressed here as a, a factorization of the, in, as a function of the number of tracks, the background and all the digits event. And we see that this a measurement from the production in terms of the eta um, from the PT of the of the two jets and also the 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 the, the C the, the asymptote angle. So with these uh, uncertainties uh, these cap fractions can stop decreasing. We see that from uh, going from seven to 13 TV. And there's also a trend uh, which is observed are uh, lower energies from 0.73 TV to 1.8 TV. So as a summary, we have shown here the coherent jet side state of art that is measured by the different collaborations at LEC. And there also we see how the nuclear suppression factor and how the LACB and ALICE have helped to understand this uh, uh, production of jet side. And there's also been shown that there is a way to extract um, L X to in the order of 10 to minus five for neutron emissions and peripheral photon productions. And also uh, for the coherent row, we, we still see that we are still far from the black disk regime. And the inclusive single diffractive dissociation from the cross section and the comparison with the bench generation predictions are consistent. And it, as an overview of um, some uh, representative uh, measurement from soft and diffraction measurements is being uh, presented uh, here. And we see that uh, in general, LAC has provided access to a large phase space as well as a new energy scale for understanding very different aspects from QCD. And uh, in particular, CMS is a rich program uh, now with a perfect testing for the ground of uh, QCD uh, models. And we would like to improve our picture from the nuclear structure and atom collisions um, also with universality. So uh, we see that the energy measurements in the very forward rapidity regions are uh, indicating that there's still um, interesting measurements to come. So stay tuned for next measurement. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, okay. Hirais, for this nice uh, review. So, so now, are there some questions or comments to Hirais? Please uh, raise your hands or you can talk uh, directly also. Let me check if there are some raised hands. Yes, uh, Vladek, go, go ahead. Hello, so uh, I'd like to talk, I, I assume you can hear me well, right? Yes, yes, go okay. ahead. You, you, you never know. 
takes yeah. time to switch from one to another. So the quick question regarding the new uh, measurements and new results, uh, does it mean that uh, we can expect more results from the previous runs of the LHC or this refers to the future of the LHC upgrades? No, they're still going uh, uh, analyzing uh, data from round one and round two that are still uh, to come, yeah. And which ones do you think are on, on the top of your list? Well, for in the case of, uh, of the coherent GEP side, there's uh, some measurements on particular that we are working, for example, for the nuclear suppression factor to understand this and uh, help uh, the production of GEP side state. Yes, I know also in, uh, in CMS, there are, there are many, many analyses yes. going on. I mean, from diffraction or uh, QCD analysis, I mean, all areas, there are still some results that will come out with the, the data that were taken, I mean, definitely. So the topic, I, I had a little bit of my own agenda here, I'm sorry, but uh, any, any results, I think CMS and Totem are, and also Atlas are working on central exclusive production, am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Both so, high mass and low mass. I mean, all uh, all domain in masses, basically. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And uh, I have maybe uh, one question, Iris, related to uh, single diffractive events. I don't know if there were some ratio that were plotted at thirteen TV and the seven or eight TV, because what we see in uh, jet, jet gap jet, for instance, there will be a detailed talk, uh, I think tomorrow maybe about it, but we see no further suppression of diffractive event uh, between uh, 13 and uh, eight TV using jet gap jet events. So I was wondering if the same was observed for single diffractive events when we detect one proton in the final stage. So I don't know if there were some ratio that were measured between 13 and eight TV. This would be interesting, yeah. Yeah, for now there, there's, well, I haven't seen that, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it's very interesting to compare it so that we can see if it was uh, any effect. Yeah, because definitely uh, between A TV and the uh, certain TV, what was expected is a factor two suppression that doesn't seem to be seen in the data. So this is something which is interesting. Yeah, okay. Are there more questions, comments to erase? We have a bit of time. Blodek, you have one more question? Or I see your hand raised, or maybe it's from before. <laughs> uh, no, no, this is the old one. I, I, I okay. thought I lowered it, but uh, maybe I did. Okay. Thank no. you, Christoph. No, no, you're welcome. So somebody, somebody else, another question? Or suggestions, I mean, remarks? And again, we'll have some time for discussion anyway. I mean, so yeah, after the, 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 at the end of the day today. Okay, so I don't see any more raised hand. So thank you, thank you, uh, Iris, again. Thank you very much. And then the next talk uh, will be given by, it will be the physics at the AAC by Sundun Ning Tu. So you should be able to, uh, to share your screen. Can you hear me first? Yes, yes, that's good. Okay. So we'll you. mute uh, for now. Yeah. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for the organizers uh, for the invitations. This is really an uh, honor to be here. Uh, and I was charged to uh, talk about uh, saturations at the EIC. Um, and then um, nowhere in a place to summarize saturations, uh, but then I can only give my personal perspectives on experimental signatures. Even that, I only can be selective on things that I know uh, mostly. So, so today, uh, first I wanna talk about the structure of nucleons, uh, starting from saturations, that the proton, I think uh, this is one of the most amazing aspect personally i think uh, in particle physics um, which is the structure of the nucleons that uh, we understand the protons about like half a century ago and then to now uh, from low to high energies that we're basically looking at the very very different protons 
from valence quarks to C quarks and to the gluon dominated uh, regimes in the very high energies. And then the way that we probe um, is like in a textbook that probe by uh, mostly the deep inelastic scattering um, that we have uh, come up with the structure functions F2 where we observe very two distinct regions where that uh, in the valence quark regions, we see the, the Birkin scaling. And then when we go into higher, um, sorry, higher um, energies and lower X that we saw the scaling violation where we saw the presence of gluons. Um, so then this com comes with this famous diagram in this uh, log one over X versus log the Q square where this is um, the regime um, that it is predicted there's a saturation where you have in the, in the low um, Q squares and uh, in the low X. And then the questions, um, the, the saturations that was came out of idea, the basic um, uh, expectations that it should exist because the, uh, um, because there's certain limits that uh, this gluons cannot just growth uh, unlimited. Um, it should be a balance at some points um, by these recombinations and splittings. But the real question is um, how to tell where in these regimes and uh, where is this limit? Or in very specific uh, questions uh, from the experimental point of views, uh, what are the signatures of these saturations? And uh, so there are early signatures. I think there are many, many signatures because if you're looking at this diagram, whatever the physics that were probed in this regime, you can say it is somewhat sensitive to saturations, but of course the sensitivities are different. Um, but then for the early signatures uh, as Hera, I'm just giving one example. And, and this is uh, from the diffractive, inclusive diffractive uh, F2 where I think the saturation model successfully describes uh, the F2 data. And I think one of them is uh, the overall normalization of this diffractive data is a direct result of saturation model without any further fits. Um, so in, in back in, uh, in the Herod uh, times, I think the saturations was already very crucial in trying to understand the data from uh, structure function like F2 and also diffractive structure functions. But then there's a signature that Rick, um, this is uh, from the heavy ion communities um, where they also use saturation models to predict, for example, uh, four particle predictions, uh, productions. And then this is a very interesting uh, uh, figure. I think this is kind of uh, old, uh, almost 20 years ago that they have this so-called a nuclear modification factor where you measure how many particles in nucleus normalized by um, DDA, and then you compare with the proton. I think that's basic ideas. And then you can have this uh, model prediction, basically this RPA, uh, whereas if there's no other nuclear effect, you should stay at one. But then when you go from low to high energies or uh, to high rapidities, they have a very distinct, distinct qualitative predictions where this RPA should behave more suppressed. And this is exactly what was saw in the early RIC data uh, from bronze, for example. I think all experiments at RIC have seen this, but I think for bronze um, that this was a very famous uh, results that when you go into four rapidities, from zero, from central to four rapidities, you see the charged hadrons uh, RDA. Um, this is uh, very suppressed. <clears throat> and then there are its new results, I think mean, coming to 2021 uh, on the uh, di pi zero uh, correlations in the four uh, mesons uh, spectrometer. So this is uh, um, a P uh, proton gold uh, collisions uh, where that uh, you have this FMS, this four meson spectro uh, uh, spectrometer, and then you correlate to pi zero and you see their back to back uh, correlations. And you see that this is some calculations that in P gold, um, this uh, is essentially 
a high X quark scattering with the low X gluon. And if this gluon is saturated or in this saturation regime, that you will expect it to see this back-to-back -back correlation uh, suppressed. And then this new results in star was uh, observed that from proton, you see around one is compared to herself. And then you have uh, a to the one third dependence of these suppressions. And this is almost the sort of back of envelope expectations uh, from desaturation pictures. And then there's their signature at the LHC. I'm giving just very brief examples. For example, um, also the forward particle production like D0 at LHCb, they also see the suppression in forward directions. And then most, one of the most interesting at the uh, LHC is also the small system uh, flow in heavy ions where there's intensive investigations on this origin of collectivity. Um, and ridge uh, search in PP, PA, and AA collisions. And I think there are two paradigm or two campaigns uh, that was in debate for at least the past 10 years. I think saturations plays a very important role. And I do not have time to, to get into this, but I just wanna point out, this is also uh, a signature um, in how saturation plays in this topic. But then after flashing through a few results, I think the real question is um, how to nail it down experimentally. I think uh, all the experiments, Hera, Rick, and LHC show promising hints of saturations, um, but none of them are conclusive. Otherwise we probably would have declared a discovery. Um, so then the, the experimentally, I think this is one of the, the pillars uh, of the EIC physics, which I'm going to talk about. This is the next generation QCD machine that will be built at the uh, at Brookhaven National Lab. And then what to look for at a EIC. I think there are many things that we should be looking at. I think uh, just as what we have looked at, at RIC, at HERA, at LHCs, uh, we should be focusing on um, from inclusive to more exclusive channels. And then the one of the advantage of at the EIC is this electron ion where we have the nucleus uh, as the target, where this nuclear will provide this um factor that you can actually see saturations or get into saturation regime much earlier, uh, or at least when you were looking at, at the same energies. I think this is so-called the cheapest way to go to the saturation regime. Um, and then I think extraordinary discovery requires extraordinary evidence. I think we need to look for all of them um, as signatures. And then all of them has to point to the same directions in order to really nail it down that uh, we have found saturations. <laughs> and in this talk, mostly I have been working on diffractive vector mesons. So uh, this is will be mostly what I'll be talking about at the EIC. So the diffractive vector meson at the EIC, um, this is just as a very, just as an analogy in this single slit diffractions uh, where we study this in college physics, where you have a, a, you have a slit and then you have a um, width of the slits and then you send light through and then you have a screen uh, at the back where by doing this experiment uh, in optics that you will see this diffractive patterns and these diffractive patterns will be like this, uh, uh, this band. And then the, the, the amplitude of this, this light band is just um, like a diffractive pattern. And, and how this diffractive pattern is structures tells you the width of this um, object um, or, or this uh, width of the slits. And in at the EIC, I think this is exactly like uh, this experiment. Uh, we sort of stick our nucleus in, into this uh, uh, slit or as a slit, and then we perform uh, uh, diffractions on this nucleus. And then this will actually give us a so-called diffractive pattern when you do a coherent gypsy productions uh, in the momentum space. So this is the um, the sigma dt, the differential cross sections as a function of the momentum transfer 
uh, T distributions. And, and as you see, this is the simulations from Cetra that uh, you have a diffractive pattern, which is the coherent uh, gypsy productions. And then also when you have this uh, flat distribution, which is coming from the incoherent uh, productions. So for the coherent productions, and this is um, the, the T distributions is uh, Fourier transformation of the source distribution, which is in this case for, for the gypsy production is the gluons um, uh, impact parameter B distributions. So this was a nice studies uh, by uh, Topias and, uh, and Thomas. Um, and then this was also featured uh, in, the, in the white paper that this is one of the golden measurements of uh, studying the gluon uh, spatial distributions or, or gluon impact parameter distributions in the gold or lead nucleus. And this is by measuring these coherent diffractive patterns, we can do the four transformations back to the uh, impact parameter distributions. And then they have these Wood Saxon distributions as the input. And then when you for it transform them back that you basically get uh, uh, what it was input. Um, however, the question is where is saturations? So I think here I want to um, to point out that not every diffractive vector mesons will be able to really see saturations. And as you see that in this figure um, that you do have two, sets of uh, model where one you have the saturations turn on and one you don't you do not have the saturations and you see this opens in solids they're very very close to each other they're they're not that dramatic uh, dramatically different and that is where this sets in with the different probe uh, of this diffractive vector meson program where you need multiple different vector mesons to see the saturations effect and then this one, uh, I think, uh, is five mesons, uh, where um, using the same model, turning on and off the saturation, you see the diffractive pattern, um, this coherent productions, it's very different. So basically, uh, from this paper, it's the dipole size um, that is larger for the five meson. And uh, intuitively, you uh, more saturation will be seen um, by the probe. So the ideal measurements at the electron ion collider will be you have some very heavy meson like gypsy to measure this uh, coherent diffractive pattern to actually um, measure the gluon impact parameter distributions, but probably less sensitive to saturation. And then you use a different uh, vector meson like phi to really see the um, also the saturation effects and um, with a scanning with different uh, vector mesons. And then now it goes to the, the challenge part where there's challenges to the coherent vector meson production. And this is where we mostly uh, worked on in the past few years. Um, because when we're looking at this exclusive process, um, this is sort of the, the cleanest process that you only have a gypsy produced in the final state besides the scatter electrons and the uh, scatter gold nucleus. Um, but then you see that after a little bit of the T, uh, after 0.05, um, then now you need a huge reduction factors uh, to beat down the incoherent productions uh, in this uh, vector meson channels. And then when you go into higher T that you probably need to up, uh, up, uh, up to a thousand times of reduction power to actually see um, the coherent diffractive um, uh, distributions. So the, this is a real challenge as how do we identify or distinguish the two uh, processes between coherent and incoherent. Um, and then I think we, what we did is we combined a model and a detector IR simulations to, to see what's the best way to achieve um, to, to get the coherent productions. So the incoherent vector meson productions is the, uh, is the channels that we're looking at because this is the incoherent productions. We first want to simulate this um, in the event generator, uh, and then we want to see how well we can uh, veto them. So what we use is so-called a Beagle, a general purpose EA multicolor generator. 
Um, I won't go into details, but I just want to tell you a few things about Beagle. So Beagle is a hybrid model that the primary process is simulated by Pythia 6. So um, you can have an electron uh, emitting a virtual photon hitting on a quark or a, a proton in, inside of a nucleon. Um, and this is simulated just by like a Pythia 6 and EP. And then the, um, the parton, uh, we use uh, the nuclear PDF, the EPSO9 to make, make the nuclear effect. And then we have DPM jets to simulate the nuclear geometry, which is sort of like a Glauber model that uh, basically tells you statistically which nucleon are you going to hit? Are you going to be your primary nucleon to simulate your Pythia process? And then the, the nuclear remnants um, that will be simulated by FUCA. And this is actually an important part of this studies where you have an electron lead or electron gold uh, diffractive uh, processes uh, for incoherent productions, but then your nuclear excited remnants uh, needs to decay. And that is how we detect this is the incoherent uh, productions. So this part of the um, simulation is very essential. So the incoherent vetoing at the EIC, I think the basic idea here is a sketch of the forward uh, interaction regions where this is the B0 dipole magnet and detectors. And then the collision happens right here. Um, the forward going direction is the ion or hydron going directions. And then they're going through a very complex the regions, but then we stick uh, a few different detectors for the, uh, the protons uh, and the neutrons in the ZDC. Um, and then in the central detector, we want very, very clean, except just the uh, scattered electrons and gypsi. And then the forward regions at the EIC should be completely empty. Um, so the general veto procedures um, is we veto events with particles that in the main detector to ensure uh, this is exclusive except for the scatter electrons in gypsi. And, there, and then there's also no particles, uh, and no particles at all, protons, neutrons, photons detected in the far four uh, regions. So the vetoes by steps. So the goal uh, that we're trying to achieve is to reach the, the three minimum positions. So here, this is the, the plus from Satra that uh, the coherent diffractive pattern has three minima. And then it was study that this minima is very important to be reached, I think. Um, otherwise, when you do the four transformation back to the uh, gluon distributions, it will has a huge smear uh, effect that if you do not have uh, the sensitivity to this minima. So our goal was trying to follow this and, and, and see how well we can suppress the incoherent productions to the minima. So then what we did, this is in Beagle, and this is of course not done by myself, and this is done by uh, the whole team uh, at BNL of Beagle. And um, we have the incoherent productions from Beagle um, as this um, uh, black curves. This is the total. Um, and then we're trying to look at the signatures or look at the uh, final state products to, to veto the, the process. So the first one is, there's no activity in main detector except scattered electrons and gypsi. And then veto two is there's no neutron in the ZDC. Um, and then we're only showing a few ones is veto two, four, six, seven. And as you can see, basically what it means is there's no neutron in ZDC. There's no protons in any of this detector, either Roman pots or off momentum detectors or B0. And then finally, we, we also try to veto photons in B0 and ZDC. And uh, here you see this distribution is keep coming down. And then we are able to reach the first minima uh, from the, inc the, the total to the, the last one, the veto seven, but then we're still missing some factors um, for the second minima and third minima. And this is so far the best that we can do at the current setup. Um, or we already in a B0 is a very complicated um, uh, design. So everything is preliminary, but we stick uh, with some pre-shower um, trying to detect the photons. Um, and then even that, that we cannot uh, reach the second and the third minimum. 
So then we were interested, what are the events that got left behind? So why are we not detecting them? So this is the two distributions actually for, for the residuals that, um, uh, that we cannot veto at least at the moment. And, and this is the theta versus momentum. So the scattering angle versus the total momentum of the beam remnants. Um, and then this is, as you see the scale, this is at TV, uh, 20 TV levels because you, you have uh, almost close to the beam rigidities um, that is very peak at one and very narrow. And then if you see on the right, this is the distribution of the A coming out of the, um, uh, the incoherent productions. And after VTO7 is this very narrow peak around uh, lead 20A. So it's dominated, you can say it's dominated by 208, 207, 206, the system. And then most of them are only have one particle, let's say one photons or one, one neutrons that emitted. And uh, this is actually missed um, by our VTOing. And um, for details, please go to DS and see one Chan. Uh, talk uh, on this subject. And then finally, we, uh, we, we, we saw the impact of the beam pipes. And so the, for the beam pipes that um, you see this green is the best veto results from the two slides uh, before. Um, but that is, of course, with the beam pipe, because without beam pipe, it's not possible. But then we also have listed all the beam pipe configurations. Uh, we can use different material. And we see that for the best scenario where we do not have a beam pipe, and this is almost or, or barely reached to the minimum. So the question is how close can we get to this ideal case um, by really designing uh, uh, the proper beam pipe and having less impact uh, on these observables. And there's of course new ideas about a secondary focus uh, or other nucleus, um, I think this is being very actively investigated in the EIC community. And what I say EIC community, this is now into this uh, proposal uh, uh, period that uh, different proposal are trying to uh, propose their detectors. So I think this problem is uh, one of the golden channels and then we all wanted to do this. Um, so this is a very active uh, investigated now. And our paper is coming out, so stay tuned. Um, so finally, I want to look, I want to take a brief moment to talk about the, a new look at saturations, um, which is from the uh, perspective quantum entanglement. So when we're looking at a proton, and we usually believe that the proton is a pure quantum mechanical state. And then if we have the states as a psi, then we can write down the total density matrix as this um, row total. And then it's naively, you can just think about the protons at very high energy. There are so many gluons uh, pop up uh, from the protons and you cannot write all the proton states as a product states um, in, as the proton so that they are not separable uh, in basic quantum mechanics. So when they are not separable, all of these protons, um, they're uh, defined to be entangled. So at high energies, all protons are quantum entangled. And then um, in, in 2017, Kaziv and Lavigne made the predictions about the entanglement entropy, uh, which is of a Norman entropies uh, in the DIS process. So you have a protons, you perform a DIS just like what we do in, in uh, in measuring F2 and FL, you do an inclusive DIS measurement. Um, but then in this measurements, they predicted the entanglement entropy associated with the gluon is nothing but the logarithm of this XG, where XG is the gluon densities for very low X or for very high energies. And it has a very interesting feature. I'm not going to details because this deserves a completely different talk, but what I'm trying to say is it has a very interesting feature, which it has a very similar form of these famous known entanglement entropy in one plus one D conformal field theory. And then if you look at this formula, and this is the famous equations where the entanglement entropy is, has this form. 
where the C is the central charge, which counts the degree of freedom in the system. Mm -hmm. And the L is the length of the region A, where uh, the region that where you probe, and then epsilon is the resolution scale. So the, in the DIS pictures that we do um, have this probe region A and the, the complementary region B, um, and then this actually shares a very similar form uh, where XG goes as into one over X to some power. Um, and then this one over X is just sort of like the length scales in the DIS uh, process. So what I wanted to say is from this paper, um, there's an idea about um, that finding this similar form, of course, this is uh, not intended to be a proof, it was just observed to be uh, have a similar form. But then if that is the case, where this central charge in, in this uh, conformal field theory um, usually has an upper bound of one, and then if you take into this upper bound of one and then you plug it back in into the DIS process, and that actually uh, it's uh, concluded that the XG where the gluon densities needs to have an upper bound and it's, uh, um, it's less than this constant to these uh, one over X to the power of one third. And this is a natural description of saturations and high energies. And, and at this state, um, the proton is at the maximally entangled state. And this is sort of natural to think where the system is approached to maximally entangled entanglement, or in other words, the, uh, the, the entropy is, is the maximum, or you can think of the, the system is in this equilibrium, all these microstates has equal probabilities. So the entropy reaches the maximum, and that is another way to look at um, the gluon saturations. Okay, and uh, this is some just flash some results that uh, we have done some work in looking for entanglement entropy in the proton-proton collisions at the LHC. And also that we have some results um, that um, we're going back to the H1 collaboration at HERA and looking for entanglement entropy at the EP in, in DIS measurements. Um, so if you're interested, uh, you can go to these two papers. I think there will be more definitive measurements at the EIC using EA collisions. Um, as I argued earlier that uh, a nucleus that is the best environment to look for uh, signatures of saturations. Okay, so summary, I think saturation at EIC, um, this is one of the pillars of uh, the EIC program. Um, it's definitely very, very important um, for the, our understanding to the nuclear and nuclear structure. Um, and then, of course, saturation is very important um, in this regime. It almost affects um, many different observables. Um, I think this is what I want to conclude. I think extraordinary discovery really requires extraordinary evidence um, that at the EIC, I hope we can put a nail on it and really um, discover this uh, very important features. Um, that through all of these channels, um, and then today I just talked about a few of them. And thank you very much. So thank you, thank you very much for this uh, very nice and uh, pedagogical talks. So I'm sure there should be quite a few uh, questions or comments. So please raise your hands or ask the question directly. I see Vladek has a question. Yeah, this is uh, just to warm up the audience. Uh because I'm from that community. Uh, Kong, very nice talk. Uh, can I just, uh, could you go back to the slide on, on the phi and all those diffractive minima where you show, uh, yeah, I think that's the one. Uh, <clears throat> since you are the expert, I just listening to your very, as Christoph said, pedagogical talk, I just realized that in real life, we may see both uh, coherent production that come from saturation and uh, no saturation. Is that possible or would it? And then, then of course, these two curves would, would sort of mix. Is, so if it is possible, is there a way to disentangle or you just tell me this is a crazy question, so it's not going to happen? I mean, it's a good question. And I think the point of having this different scans have, have this 
For example, you have this level armed in Q square and you also have different species. And that is, I think one of the main reasons of doing that is to dis in, in some way to disentangle this effect. Um, because if you're going to, let's say, Upsilon, even higher mass, that will expect the saturation effect is uh, very small, um, just like uh, in JIP psi that you already see the differences are very small. And then when you're going to phi that you will see a larger effect. I think this effect will be seen more by comparisons to for different vector meson channels. I mean, if you only look at one vector meson channel, of course, um, both saturation and no saturation, you also see diffractive, uh, um, the, the diffractive coherent productions, and you probably wouldn't be able to tell what what, what it means uh, for saturations. I think this really has to done to be done through the, uh, a systematic uh, studies and comparisons. And this uh, this probe is not the probe to um, uh, how should I phrase it to on site the saturation. Like uh, something happens that saturation, something doesn't is not. I, I think this is more like a saturations. Um, uh, dynamics where you you really compare through different channels and different vector mesons to see what it what it does on this um, processes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So there are more questions, comments. I have maybe maybe one which is a bit uh, more uh, general. I mean the. Would there be a strategy, let's say, to combine some uh, data in completely different uh, kinematical domain that are basically uh, like data from the EIC and lead lead data from the LHC to see a coherent image by combining uh, both data sets towards looking for, uh, for saturation? I mean, in the same way that for the other one that we'll discuss tomorrow, that we needed Tevatron and LHC data. So couldn't we have a kind of... Uh, generic way to look for saturation by using both uh, facilities. And this is a bit also the, the goal of the, the workshop in a way that will, will go on also next year. I mean, it's more general question, of course, maybe more for discussion, but do you have some uh, idea about this or? Yeah, but I think, I, I think in some way, um, there, there are many observables that can be seen at, at the LHC, of course, and then the energy reaches even higher. Um, okay. And then, but the, I, I think the, I think it's complementary in the way that in the EIC, we have the lever arms in Q square, um, where the, at the, at the LHCs that um, if you're looking at, let's say UPC, that is mostly photo productions. Yeah. I but definitely, I yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry for interrupting. No, I was more thinking, I mean, to have a model that, I mean, for instance, if we see some saturation in this domain at the LHC or the IC, what would be the implication of the measurement at the LHC, the same kind of measurement so that we can get a coherent picture between the two to see that the both data sets are compatible to our, with the same model or the same domain where we reach saturation, this kind of ideas maybe, I don't know. I think there is some work along these directions already from mm -hmm. Satra, uh, from uh, Thomas Ulrich and uh, Topia. Um, I think they have done using this uh, kind of along to what you said um, and trying to calculate in their models in this Cetra models at the uh, at the LHC. Um, so so and then they compare with the LHC data and see if this is compatible. And yes. I think it is uh, that is exactly along uh, uh, in what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think what they said is I think in in PA collisions. Uh, I forgot exact conclusions, but I think it's the JIP side. It's very uh, less sensitive to this saturations, but probably in lead, lead in other um, uh, in other observables, I think that is more sensitive to saturation. For example, um, and, and they also discussed the importance of incoherent productions and the um, the the nuclear fluctuations and things like that. And but that is completely aligned with what you just said. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. So I see two raised hands. So Saran, Saran, you have a question? Yeah, I had, I had actually two questions on this slide, um, or maybe even three. Uh, the, the, the first one is, so you, you mentioned JPSI and Phi, right? I mean, what about uh, actually other states like Psi2S or so? Um, 
could, could you also measure that? And then the second question is, uh, I mean, so, so here you're focusing on, on, I mean, of course, the low T where you see coherent and incoherent. I was just wondering what is the sort of the anticipated T range that you can go on the on the higher T end for the for the incoherent actually, because that's also interesting in principle. Right, right. Yeah, for the incoherent, it's like you, you do an EP, right? Um, so I think now the, the range, um, we can go to, if we're designing the detectors, I think we usually, we, we mostly, we can go to up to, I don't know, 1.5 or two. So at HERA, I think this can go to very high T. Um, high so high. I don't see why not that we cannot go to high T. Um, but showing this plot is because it's EA is, is gold, uh, where mostly it's um, the, the T, T range is very narrow in the very low T regions. But I don't think we have a, uh, I, I think we can go to higher T. That, that, that's that's mm -hmm. for sure. And on the first question? <laughs> so, uh, so sorry. Well, uh, oh, first question was yeah. side to I, I think so. I, I think this needs to be investigated more with now all of the detector proposals are, are investigating with the realistic detectors and see if this can be reconstructed. Um, but we haven't done this study on, on, on site 2S on this particular observables, but I think that is possible probably. Thank you. So Christoph, you have also a question? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question and a comment. Uh, it's about this entanglement. So uh, as far as you remember, the uh, results uh, by Kof, uh, Karatsev and, and Levin are uh, based uh, just on uh, BFKL equations, so they don't address any uh, saturation, any nonlinearities in their uh, derivation of this of this formula. So, how, how do you see a link to saturation? This is the the first question, yeah, and the, and the yeah. other one is, I mean, and then there was this comparison to to data from Hera where mm -hmm. I, I think just uh, collinear PDFs were used and to plugged into this formula. So, uh, yeah, so, so, the, so, so how do you see the connection to saturation here? Right, I, I think um, I could be wrong, but that is the beauty that I saw from the study is they did not start with something like uh, 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 a nonlinear or something with the saturations. Um, I think they basically uh, look at this entanglement entropy and what they found is this similar form to this um, uh, this one plus one D CFT uh, entanglement entropy. And by some uh, some basic arguments on the upper bound of this uh, central charge, I think this was uh, implies that the gluon densities will have a bound. Um, and, and this is, has nothing to do with uh, all, all the, uh, the, I would say, normal saturations framework. Uh, but this is really a, a features that was uh, just in the entanglement entropy uh, by itself. Okay, so so. And this is not we're... approved. And as I said, this is not approved. This is was observations uh, from. The okay, audience. so then then they expect that eventually their framework should be kind of refined to account for saturation because they see it in this conformal field theory. Am I correct? Well, yeah, I, I think I think they are working on this in this okay. direction, or, or maybe not. I, I I this I'm not sure whether they are they're working on this, but um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. And, and you said the uh, for the uh, for the Hera data, yeah. Um, are you talking about this one? Yes. And and, uh, and yes, yes. I think yes. This this is the uh, right. And 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 I think to describe the data, um, you're right. Not only in a model of entanglement uh, can describe. I think um, uh, their their Monte Carlos can can describe at high Q square and then. Uh, it probably has some deviations for low Q square if you if you go into the paper, um, that is for sure. Um, so 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 that 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 is um, that is true. But then I think for 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 this entanglement entropy, we also have a very good uh, comparisons uh, with the um, with the model. Um, whether this is unique, I don't think it is unique. Uh, we we were measuring. Uh, charge particle multiplicity distributions where you know tons of different models can describe 
or or, or yeah. at least attempt to describe. Yes, yeah, uh, but but I what what I what I meant here is that to get this so, uh, this this uh, entropy, uh, they used uh, I think collinear PDA webs were just used to plug to this formula for entropy. So so that's mm -hmm. why uh, this motivated my question: How do they see a link to saturation if they use just collinear PDFs? As the formula, as the as the input to this entropy formula, but but uh, yeah, but I, I think you answered my question. So. Okay, I see. Okay, yeah, because that that collinear PDF has nothing to do with saturation. In the first exactly. Part. I said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. So then, more question comments. I do not see more raised hands. So thank you, thank you very much again. So now I think we have the coffee break. Let's